Welcome to the Swim Swam podcast. I'm your host, Coleman Hodges. Joining me today, she has been dubbed the new lesbian supreme. <laughs> Coming to us from Las Vegas, we are sitting down with 1500 Olympic silver medalist from the 2020 Tokyo Games, Erica Sullivan. Hello. Or 2021. Oh my god! It says, <laughs> I hate it. They so that like it's officially the 2020. It is. So like we and like I had we had to keep writing that, and so now I just say it. Okay, I've, so 2020 I've, stuck. I've immersed myself in the lie. Okay. <laughs> or okay. In the, whatever. Do you say 2020 or 2021? I've. It depends. It's different every time. So now I've just realized. <laughs> My perfect compromise is the Tokyo Olympics. And that's, that is a perfect compromise. That was it's great. Easier, yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Um, so, so starting off with, with some swimming and then we'll get into some more fun stuff. Um, mm-hmm. So coming off of trials, how, how do you feel like camp went? Um, and how do you feel like, was this your first training camp with USA for like focusing on a pool event? No, uh, okay. Pampax 2018. Okay. I qualified in pool, um, but I also did swim open water, but I was pool focused in 2018. Okay. 2019 was open water. 2020 was nothing. Um, 2021 was pool. Um, but yeah, coming off of trials, I was really depressed. I was, I'm, I won't sugarcoat it. I was really sad. I didn't swim the way I particularly wanted to. And um, I guess I had an idea in my head about how everything was supposed to feel when I achieved everything I ever wanted. And it didn't feel that way. Like I didn't feel satisfied with myself and I felt really empty and trials was just so stressful that like I didn't eat or sleep for a week from the stress. And by the time I got home, I got super sick. So I had bronchitis that week I was home. So I was like horribly ill going into Hawaii and I just kind of made it a priority for myself to try to get better and, you know, use the energy of other people at the camp and, you know, lo and behold, you find out a few weeks later that everyone was in that rut, but like we were all just kind of faking it till we made it and used each other's positivity, whether it was fake or genuine at the time to build each other up until it did become genuine, which is such a cool energy to start off camp. <clears throat> that is, that's a very unexpected energy. Um, so, I mean, so coming off trials, you're set, going into trials, you, you were really nervous. Um, yeah. And I think my position was a little bit different from the other girls on our team because like realistically, yes, they, they wanted to make the team of course, and they had to believe that they could do it for them to actually do it. But also I feel like with a lot of social media, I had a lot of people were expecting me to make the team and I wanted to deliver and Sure, I may not I may have not been the top runner, but I feel like a fair share of people realized that I took all the steps I needed to take to, you know, to make it to the Olympic team. I've been on the world's team, the Pampac team. So I, I went up the ranks very, very uh, chronologically, so to speak. Mm-hmm. So I think a lot of people did expect me to make the team. And that just put so much stress and pressure on my plate. I, and that makes that. Yeah. How could it not? Uh, was was the fifteen hundred like was that the event that you were like okay this this has to be it or were you kind of you know did you have more eggs in in other baskets as well? I put everything into the fifteen hundred, and if I didn't make it in the fifteen hundred, I was just gonna pray to God and just try to go balls to the walls for the eight. Um, that was honestly my mentality, um, but I made it in the. I made it in the 15, but the way I swam it, it really put me in a deficit. Like I went out so fast that, and I, which is not how I normally swim my miles. So it just put me in such a low that by the time the eight came around, my body was just like in such a slump that it was so hard for me to recover fast enough. 
what you mentioned you you know you weren't eating sleeping the week of trials which like i i totally get that i'm not even an mm-hmm. athlete and that week just was so stressful it was, um, emotional. It, was it was it's emotional it's a lot yeah. it's just yeah. a lot to be in that building were you able to to bounce back or get into more of a routine just outside of the pool after that 1500 and after that weight was lifted off your shoulders a bit yeah yeah not so much routine but i was able to uh, that just breathe which yeah. was a big thing i felt like i hadn't taken a breath for two weeks and then i just got to hawaii and it was like you made it you know what i mean like of course everyone on team usa wants to show up and do the best they can but there's also a mentality deep inside where it's like i still made the team you know what i mean and like they can't take it away from you take that away from you whereas like trials if you like do horrible, you don't make the team. Nothing happens. It becomes a normal swim meet. It. You know what I mean? So like the, the worst case scenario stakes are just significantly worse for trials than the games. And I think that's what's stressful. Yeah. And I, I guess we, <laughs> you, you don't hear a lot about <laughs> what happens when you don't make the team. Right. And it's just, it's, it's, it's like overwhelmingly normal, like nothing happens. Right. Which, which, which brings me to, you know, you mentioned you, you achieved the goal, you made the Olympic team and then it didn't feel like what you had expected it to. So you mean to elaborate into that? Sorry. That wasn't a question. Yeah. Yeah. So <laughs> okay, okay, what, yeah, yeah. what did it feel like? Yeah, yeah. Well, I don't know. I just, I felt like I was in a position where even though I was sad and not satisfied with my races, I felt like I couldn't be upset with the situation because at the end of the day, I still made the team. Mm -hmm. It was like, yeah, I'm unhappy with my races, but I'm on the team. What do I have to complain about? And I found myself kind of invalidating my feelings because of that. You know what I mean? And at the end of the day, I definitely had a chance of redemption more so than a lot of the other people who missed the team who were expected to make the team and my heart goes out to them. But I think we were struggling with our own issues, the own, like our own way. And I, I will say like my, I cannot compare my situation to anyone who just missed the team, but I found I had never experienced this feeling before where I was supposed to be satisfied with my results and I just wasn't. And so it was just a new feeling is the best way to describe it. It was uncharted territory, so to speak. Were you able to, to process that or, or talk, process that with anyone, talk it out with anyone, kind of relate or say like, look, I'm, I'm feeling this way. <laughs> how, how, do, how, how do? Yeah. A lot of the people at Sandpipers were walking up to me asking just because I was so sad and it was obvious to see but they all equated it to like oh don't worry Erica it's just because you're not done yet like you're gonna get a medal that's why that's why you feel unsatisfied like you're gonna get a medal and I didn't really think I was gonna do that at least at that given point in time so I was just like like guys like you're wrong it was like my mentality which is so funny now looking back (laughs) Uh, that is funny um, a little ironic of obviously, very, so, very, very <laughs> so, so you get to training camp and, and like you said, everyone kind of lifts everyone up. Um, I mean, I, I think it was obvious to see at trials. There was a lot of pressure on a lot of athletes and, uh, it, it, and I'm happy to hear that, <laughs> that whether it was very genuine, positive, you know, optimism or, or maybe a little, little fake optimism, everyone was kind of picking each other up. Um, so you, so you get through training. I have to ask, we talked to Ron, um, one of the best podcasts I've ever done. Quite controversial. A lot of people have their opinions. That's for sure. I, I, he, yeah, he was just, he, he was, he's so well-spoken. He's, you can tell he really thinks about what he does. The 1500 for time that, that the three sandpipers did on a Saturday afternoon when no one else was swimming and you're coming off bronchitis. Yeah. Can you tell me about that? Yeah, honestly, my first few days at training camp just weren't it. And I, my body was hurting so bad. And I just remember talking to Ron being like, I'm trying so hard. I don't know what's wrong with me. Like, I'm not moving. And the girls were, the girls just, they recover faster. So they were just like 
killing me at practice. I was like, what's, what's going on here? And Ron was just like, give it time, trust your body. Just, you know what I mean? Like, he's like, you're not out of shape. Like, it's just not possible. And speaking to Ron, you obviously know he's a very tempo versus stroke situation of a guy and believes in rehearsing that yardage and doing it with the tempo and the stroke count and all that jazz. And that's how our system works. And that's how our program works, whether it's, you know, agreed or not, like whether you agree or disagree with it, it's, it's been working for me for the last seven years, you know? Yeah. Um, so yeah. So I think it, we had, we had mentally like time to prepare for it and like think about how we were going to approach it. So it wasn't so much of a blindside kind of thing, but I think we, had to kind of be our own mental support system because like no one else was at the pool. I think we just had to accept, be like, okay, it's going to be by ourselves. It's going to be hard. It's only one practice. We're going to give it our all and just see what happens. And it was amazing. It was uh, our, those times were crazy. <laughs> They're crazy. Uh, yeah. c- can you remind me what you went? I want a 1622 from a portion of practice suit, <laughs> unshaved <laughs> with, with the bronchitis, which is insane. That's crazy. Yeah. yeah. Um, did, did you, were you happy with that swim? Not in terms of time, but in terms of, again, you said at, at trials, you went out way too fast. Were you happy with how you executed that? At the practice or the race? At, at the practice. Yeah. Um, yeah. It hurt less. It hurt a lot less and only going 31 seconds slower than my time at trials and having it hurt less Like I just felt smooth and relaxed and yeah, I was really confident. I felt good. And honestly, I don't think time mattered very much. It was more so how I felt and how much energy I exerted into go set into going said time and that. And then the next weekend we did two rounds of 400 freeze, um, in a tech suit, our tech suit workout and from a push. And I did a 410 and a 409 um from a push seems good (laughs) um yeah and so just those high intensity workouts and going times like that is honestly what gave me the confidence for the mile because I think we all saw how I swam that race I don't uh, some part of me took over that I could not sit and tell you in this interview how Mm -hmm. it happened but I swam that with a lot of confidence a little too much if I'm being honest (laughs) uh with, to give our listeners context what's your best 400 time uh 406 shaved and you went 409 410 I did, I did. <laughs> so so things were looking up <laughs> towards, it was towards, it was towards the end good. of camp so then heading into tokyo um the mile's kind of right in the middle of the meet right it's like mm-hmm. day five four four and five day, day three and day five in tokyo okay well right because it's like the yeah the more yeah okay um what I'm trying to say it is prelims in the night and then finals the next, next morning. Yes. We had two sleeps. Yeah. Okay. Um, how did you feel about it being right in that middle portion? It was okay. I mean, is it, just seeing how the other distance events were later than all of us just makes me grateful that we were the first one. Cause I was just so antsy and ready to go and wanted to redeem myself. So the fact that I was able to be able to do that is just like, I was so glad I would not have set it up any other way. Um, but yeah, honestly, I really benefited from the two sleeps. I think at trials where I made the mistake, we only had that one day, like we were ready to go the next day and it, it hurt. And the fact that I was able to get two sleeps and like really let my body recover in the most natural way possible. Whereas at trials, I wasn't sleeping and I wasn't getting any recovery that way was just so unbelievably helpful for me. And it, it showed in the time. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it, you, you <clears throat> went a massive personal best in that race. Mm-hmm. Uh, I I'm, do you feel like you were able to, to, to execute that race pretty well? I mean, obviously you said you swam it with maybe too much confidence, but you were, you were, you felt very good about it. I mean, obviously you were silver behind Katie Ledecky. Did you feel like that, that went about as well as it could have? Yeah. Um, well, it's so funny because Ron was like your first, like 200, 300, you looked atrocious is what he pretty much said <laughs> long story short. And there's a really funny reasoning behind that. I was behind the blocks and you know, when you get toe cramps, like in your pinky toe and you can't move your pinky toe, 
Yeah. This is so stupid. And I shouldn't even be sharing this because it's like me, like, it's not an excuse. Like I still slam what I needed to do guys. Not an excuse. Just sharing the situation. I had a toe cramp and I was on the block and being like, I can't move my toe. So like (laughs) I put my front foot on the block and you know how you wrap your toes around the block. Mm -hmm. Three of my toes were wrapping and the other two weren't. Like they just weren't (laughs) moving. I was like, Oh God, Oh God. So I'm like kicking and it feels weird. And I'm trying to like point and like, kind of like put some blood flow into it on the turn. And it's, it took like a 200 for me to like have that feeling go away. And then I was like, okay, I could go now. But like the first 200, all I was thinking was like, wow, my, my toe. (laughs) Um, So let's, let's set the stage here. First Olympic final. I'm sure the adrenaline is pumping. You feel really good. And then have you ever gotten a cramp behind the block before? I mean, and it wasn't even like a ah cramp. It was just like, yeah. why can't I feel my, my <laughs> toes right now? Like, why aren't they bending? So it wasn't even like a panic, but it was just like, gotcha. It was like, a hmm, <laughs> that's, that's, this is the first time this has happened. You know yeah. what I mean? Yes. Yeah. I, Cause I think every swimmer has been there when you get a foot cramp or a calf cramp or, you know, a quad cramp in like the middle of a kick set. And you're just like you're totally disabled and you're like, Oh, I can't move, please. Yeah. Like grabbing the lane line. So I'm, a, I, I was afraid that like, that was the situation, but just, no, just it, the mild, like, can't it, feel your toes. It was just enough for me to like, be like, wait a minute, what, what's happening? What's That's going so on? Strange. Yeah. <laughs> gotcha. Okay. So I'm, I'm glad that went well. Um, right. One way. <laughs> it, it, glad it went away. That would have been a terrible post-race media interview. <laughs> Erica, what happened to your race? That toe cramp just didn't go away. <laughs> it just, it just stayed there and it really messed with me. I think I would go down as the biggest wuss in history. Ah, uh, I don't know. Cramps are serious, man. But... I don't know, man. Survived 25 K, but then again, can't do <laughs> a mile due to pinky toe cramp. Like, that's, a, that's a bad way to go out. Touche. Okay. Yeah. I, I, I can't argue with you there. Uh, I feel, yeah. Everyone be like, what is what? Like, seriously (laughs) so so after once once the toe cramps go away you're able to get into your race did you have a pretty good idea of your positioning throughout the race no I mean I knew I was far back because the Russian girl was next to me and I was behind her but Quadrella um Chinese girl and Kroller German girl Mm -hmm. they were all in a line so I couldn't see who I passed and who I didn't pass. And I also didn't know if, and being an open water swimmer, I think very tactically of I'm making my move, but who else made their move earlier? Because we've had open water races where people have won the race because they just take off and they sneak away without anybody seeing them. And I totally thought like, how is it realistic that even though I see Katie's wake, or not even a little <laughs> bit of draft, some white water towards the end there. Sure. Is it possible that someone brought it home and made a move stronger than me and somehow passed her, which is very rare. And she's so good. So it was, it was a small thought in my mind. I, I was pretty sure I was second, but you just, you never know for sure. Cause I just, I didn't see myself pass three of them, honest to God. And Sarah Kroler, I did not see her at the end of the race or the last 500. Like, I know it looks like I was chasing her down, but on, on, honest to God, I was just counting my strokes. <laughs> that's it. Like I couldn't see. I think that's so funny. I like, this is why, I mean, there's a lot of reasons, but this is probably why I was like such a mediocre swimmer is that like, I thought you were supposed to look at everyone and I didn't realize you're just supposed to look at the bottom, especially when you're racing. Mm-hmm. And, and like, there's so many races that like come down to like, you know, obviously hundreds and then you talk to the people and you're like, I had no idea. <laughs> I was just swimming. And it's like, and what? <laughs> yeah. Well, it's so funny. Cause I look at the, the media. So like, or when I came home, my mom made me watch my race from the, the rowdy narration perspective. <laughs> mm-hmm. And it's like, you just, especially in prelims, it was like, Oh, Erica's kind of exerting herself there. When in prelims, I was totally relaxed. I felt like I had control throughout the whole time. And then it was like, suddenly Erica picks it up and it's like, yes, I picked it up, but also my stroke count stayed consistent the whole time. 
You know what I mean? So it was just, I guess it looks so much different than how it feels and how it turned out and my mental thought process throughout all of it. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, that's, that's a good reminder, good perspective to have, because again, it's like, yeah, the viewer is like, oh my God, they're, they're catching her. They're going to, she's going to get her. And you're just like one, two, five, yeah. seven. <laughs> everyone's probably like, every, I know everyone's like, Erica was probably on such a high right now. Me, I'm like, 36, 37, 38, 39. Like the most mundane monotone voice anyone has ever heard. So, so, so you touch. Yeah. And how, take, can you take me through the process of like, did you, did you realize you were second? Did you see the time first? What, what were those immediate emotions or reactions for you? I touched, I, I kind of looked down the line to see where the girls are. And I see Katie slam the water. Mm-hmm. I don't even see the girls. I don't see the girls on the wall. I just see Katie yeah. slam. So I'm like, oh, so Katie must have done something pretty gosh darn cool. So I look. <laughs> and she's celebrating because we went one and two. And I'm like, oh. Um, and then I'm usually not a cheerer on the wall. I mean, you guys have seen my races. Even after I won open water nationals, I just kind of like crawled my way into the finish shoot because I was so tired. Like, I'm not one to celebrate, but Katie started whooping and I started whooping and screamed and cheered and got out. And I wanted to take in a really historical moment because I knew that that was the first mile ever swim. The American woman, after years of just people on social media saying that American distance swimming is lacking with everyone other than Katie Ledecky, that had been the common narrative for so long. And the fact that I was able to snag one and two and or Katie was able to snag one I was able to snag two and just really make a mark and prove those people wrong just really meant a lot to me and yeah just I felt like after everything I went through it just every like it finally I was able to see some good things happen to me and I was satisfied with my results and I was happy with what I had accomplished and where I'd come from it's like the best way to describe it, I think. <laughs> yeah. I mean, so did, did that feel how you had expected it to, or did it, I mean, it was, it, was it different, but also good? It was, it was different in a better way. So trials was different because it was like a bad way where I felt empty mm-hmm. and the Olympics were different because I never thought I'd be able to feel that full because I think at the end of the day, at the end of the day, that is our coffee machine. This is, <laughs> when people ask Erica, you're an Olympian now, has everything, anything changed with your life? I say, you know, nothing has changed, but um yeah, I never thought I could feel so full after an Olympics. And it wasn't even in a sense that I went the time I wanted to achieve, but it was who I had done it with, the conversations I had with my roommates leading up to the race, the relationship I managed to build the last four weeks prior with those girls. And I didn't realize how personal it would be. Like I thought winning a medal would be so selfish because it's such a it's an individual sport. Swimming's an individual sport. And it's like, yeah, there's a a camaraderie in Team USA, but it's like, you never, you never see it. You know, even, even in the previous games, there were people in the stands. So they tend to put the camera on the stands and not so much your teammates. Mm -hmm. If that, if that makes sense. And you never really see the weeks of training and the whoopty doing of us in the crowds and in the team area after the race. And after experiencing that, I realized how amazing our team was, especially just the way it turned out, not in terms of like Team USA is a great team, but like the team we put together this year for trials was just such a kick-ass team. Pardon my language, but they they killed it. It was such a good team. And we fed off of each other so well. Yeah, we were young, but like, man, we we brought it. I, at least I think we brought it. It certainly seems like it. I mean, yeah. from, from every perspective, I mean, it, it, especially just hearing you say that, um, I, I, for, 
for, for anyone who doesn't know, including myself, who were who your roommates or roommates so, slash suite mates? Yeah, yeah. So it was uh, me, Regan Smith. Uh, we were in an apartment together uh, right next door. We in the, 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 the bedroom next door, there was Phoebe uh, Bacon and Kate Douglas. Mm-hmm. And then on the other suite in our house, it was Alex Walsh and Emma Wyatt. Okay. Powerhouse. <laughs> Powerhouse of a room. <laughs> Powerhouse. Yeah. Um, that's, that's... The best part was like me, Kate, and Alex were all done on the same day. So we were able <laughs> to go through media and stuff like that together, which was a, so much fun. Just doing it like with all your friends. Yeah. What, I mean, can you take us through that process? Because again, that's something that, that I don't, I've never seen that most people don't get to see is like, is going through an Olympic media experience. Yeah. And I can't really say how it normally goes just because it was a COVID games and it was a little different than usual, but um, yeah, it was, you get out, drug testing tags you, you do your NBC interview, which funny enough, I did not think NBC was going to stop me. If you look at the video, you see me start to walk away from the NBC line because I thought they wanted to talk to Katie Uh and then they stopped me and I was like, oh, me too. Like, (laughs) wait a minute. So we had that and then take you through journalism, um, go back to the team room, you switch your outfits, all that stuff. And then they take you to the press conference. And that's usually your time to shine. At least uh, that's how I view it. That's just, you know, you don't get that many like it's it sucks that this is the world we live in but in terms of team usa you usually don't get your moment if you don't get a gold you know what i mean yeah and so if you're silver you get a press conference and i just knew um that was my opportunity to say what i feel like deserved to be said and what needed to be said and honestly it just kind of came to me in the heat of the moment i didn't even go in planning on saying anything that i said into the press conference but it, it paid off <laughs> <laughs> um can you can you give us a, a small recap i mean what 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 uh what do you feel like was so was so cool about getting to speak your piece and, and say those things that you wanted to and got to say yeah and i think i was able to say stuff that i would have loved to hear when i was younger mm-hmm. um just being in the closet and being asian american just hearing someone say that would have been really really cool and Though I didn't go in with a plan to be the beacon of hope for those people, it just kind of fell with the words that came to me in the moment, like epitome of the American dream. I have no idea where that came from. Um, that was like a script moment. And usually that, that doesn't come to me first draft. That usually takes a few drafts. So <laughs> I just think um, the emotions of it all just really gave me an interesting perspective of it and give it, gave me an opportunity to be really well-spoken shockingly well-spoken more spoken than I usually am I, I don't know man I, I I have found you to be very well-spoken but that mm-hmm. is that is really cool that you got your opportunity to shine and and it you really you really did and it, it blew up it really <laughs> blew up it that's blew when the up. madness really started <laughs> yeah so let's let's talk about this madness I mean you uh did you did you see the results of that Immediately did it take like 24 hours? Um, yeah. Tell me about the progression of, of now you, you being this social media icon. So in terms of social media, right after the race, I did go up to followers quite a bit. I went up, but not significantly. It, it really, you would think that most of the build happens after your race, but mine did not come from the race, which puts me in a different situation than a lot of other athletes on this team. Yeah. So I, I get back from media it's been a long day. It's around 1230 at night. Um, my Today Show interview isn't even posted yet. And I'm laying in bed. And someone sends me, my best friend, Ryan Little, one of my best friends, he sends me a link saying, I heard there's a Gaylor in the Olympics. You don't know what a Gaylor is. It's people who thought that Taylor uh, dated a woman at some point in her life. And me being gay and I am cautiously optimistic. So I, I do claim that I'm a gayler. Like I, I like to think, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So I was so tired and sleep deprived. And I wasn't really thinking. And I just quote tweeted and said, yeah, I'm a proud gayler. Exploded. Stan Twitter found it. All these questions start coming in after that. Erica, do you watch Killing Eve? 
Erica, do you watch Glee? Erica, do you watch The Wilds? Do you ship so-and-so, so-and-so, so-and-so? Now I'm a film major. I've been watching a lot of TV and a lot of movies for all my life. We've talked about this on our last podcast. Mm -hmm. So of course I bring it. I'm like, yeah, I've seen that. Yeah, I I ship them. Oh, funny enough, I DM them. Like, you know what I mean? Like I just had the receipts lined up because I've been talking about this for years. (laughs) No one's just, no one's noticed me. It's not the fact that like, you know what I mean? It's not the fact that I changed and I stepped up to the occasion. Mm -hmm. I was just flying under the radar. Yeah. And uh, yeah, so the Twitter blew up. I, I, I was like, I need to go to bed. I need to go to bed. Wake up. Instagram exploded. Twitter was even worse. Um, TikTok wasn't too crazy yet. TikTok wasn't bad. But um, yeah. And then I wake up the next morning and they uploaded the Today Show clip interview of my press conference. Okay. And it ended up getting 500,000 views around. And a lot of celebrities started posting it on their stories, which was shocking. Mm-hmm. And just through that, and then through the Twitter and me DMing celebrities and them finding out about it, <laughs> and then celebrities follow it, just they followed me back and they started DMing me. It really just snowballed into this huge thing. Mm-hmm. I started becoming the lesbian supreme. I started getting fan edits. Before you know it, there was a BuzzFeed article, a Vulture article. It just, when I say it snowballed, that's like the only way I could describe it. Like I didn't, I just said I was a gayler. Before you know it, I'm like the queen of Stan Twitter apparently. And there's like fan edits of me on Twitter, which is so bizarre. And I I love it. Like, especially on Twitter, it's been so much fun. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> which, which, uh, again, saying you're a gayler is something that like you would have said <laughs> for the past 10, I mean, 15 Coleman, years. You know this. Life. How many atrociously gay themed things <laughs> have I said throughout the years? This is nothing new for any of us. For people yeah, who've known yeah. me in the sport, realize that this is old news. Like, I wore suspenders to Golden Goggles, guys, and I was trying to go for the euphoria theme. This which is was, Ben, which was. <laughs> Thank you. (laughs) But it's been done. I've been doing it for a while. And now that people are starting to take notice and they're like, I don't feel alone is so comforting because when I was in high school and I was like a fifth harmony stan and no one else liked fifth harmony, I felt so alone. You know what I mean? So just Mm -hmm. being able to be like, oh my God, wait, I can be, I think people take social media too seriously where it's like, an opportunity to share your political opinions or things like that. It's like, and I think that's why a lot of people don't like Twitter. They say it's too political. And my response is like, I don't know what kind of Twitter you're on, but we just talk about how gay our favorite TV shows are and any new movie that came out. We're just obsessing over that, honestly. You know what I mean? Like it just, yeah, it's just, we. I like how the younger generation has created a new narrative for social media. And then through that, they said, make TikTok and what's your letterbox and what's your Tumblr. So that also just kind of snowballed into that. And, and now we're here with Camila Cabello and the entire Wilds cast following me. Camila. <laughs> Camila, Camila. I need Camila. to. Camila, my bad. I got uh, destroyed when I said Camila on the TikTok. <laughs> I'm tired. <sighs> um, that, that's, it's, it's, it's good to know. Name, names are always it's just, yeah, it's. Yeah, I, I, I names will. Are, names can be hard. In the in the fandom, I understand that it's a very adamant thing to make sure they say her name right. So it is Camila Cabello. Camila Cabello. There we go. So Camila. Camila. Um. So you. I mean, you mentioned that you have this sense of you have this bigger sense of community now. You obviously mm-hmm. have an audience now. Um, when, when you didn't have this again, when you were in high school and and you felt a little more alone in that, um, how, how did you deal with that or, or, or what are ways that, you know, you were just able to move through, keep going? Was that ever suffocating or, you know, overwhelming at times? Yeah, I definitely felt alone. I felt weird. I always felt like the weirdo in the room and like, to some extent I am. And honestly, the weirdos are the ones who make cool art. And I think that's what kind of inspired me to be a film major is like, I was the outcast. 
I was, I was the weirdo, you know what I mean? In the most film major way possible. I was the weirdo in the room. Um, but I guess I had to tell myself that because again, I was online. I've been on Twitter since I was 16 years old. Like it, I knew there was a world out there because I would retweet a tweet that had 2000 retweets or 30 K likes. I knew 30 K people existed in the world. It just wasn't within my realm of people within Vegas, especially at Summerlin Palo Verde high school, which was very Mormon heavy. It just, that group for me didn't exist. So I had to always have the mentality that I just needed to make it out of high school. And I think a lot of, I think a lot of closeted people are like that. It's just make it through high school and college. And later in life, I'll find the group where I belong. You, you know what I mean? I don't know if that makes sense, but you know, your sense of longing is just outside of high school and that you will figure it out later. And you're just holding on to hope, that kind of hope. And I, I, I did that. I did that. It's, it's a really common experience. I did nothing special really. I, to say it's common it is, is I think probably fair, but I, I think that doesn't make it any less special. I think it's, it's probably a very cool and euphoric experience to, to feel that sense of community and that sense yeah. of belonging. And like getting put in all these like Twitter group chats where, you know what I mean? I'm not an Olympian. Like, I mean, yeah, the medal is cool. And like, they, they're like, they would love to see the medal, but it's like, oh my God. Um, let's see. Mia Healy just posted a new Instagram photo about the wild cast season two. And everyone freaks out about that. And like, I add my two cents and I laugh at their stuff. They laugh at my stuff. And I'm glad I found them. I feel like I got, I, I made a Twitter post about this, but um, I feel like I made like 12, however many followers I have, I consider them all my friends. I feel like I just got a bunch of new friends and that's just, that's so cool. Cause it's like, it's friends who I feel are like at my level, which is so comforting. And, and not only that, but to, to have swimming take you there in a sense, you know, to, yeah. it, it, to, it's just the butterfly effect where I swam fast. I had the press conference. Someone had happened to find out that I was a Gaylor fan. I happened to see the tweet. I happened to be super sleep deprived from media day because of the swimming that I just put out a stupid response back. And then it exploded into a whole nother animal. Like, Honestly, like I, uh, I typically get imposter syndrome in these kind of things where I tell myself, like, I just got lucky and I've been, I've been trying not to do that as much lately to give my, give myself credit where credit's due. But in terms of the whole social media thing, I got lucky. I can't comprehend it any other way. I just got really freaking lucky. You know, I think there, I think luck is, is a part of a lot of things, but I get from, to to me, that's like, well, again, you, you put yourself, you gave yourself this platform through like all your years of hard work in the pool and, and then, and the years of being very authentic with who you are and with yourself. And then that kind of all, all congealed into this, this, this 12 hours. (laughs) madness it still hasn't like it's so funny because I will get like thirst comments on Twitter and on TikTok for the older generation who doesn't know what that is yeah thirst comments are when people think you're attractive and they are like hyping you up so to speak (laughs) and all my friends who personally know me are like Erica that 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 little nerdy kid over there and it's it's so funny how through me being authentic I've gotten this image created of me you know what I mean and it's it's super cool that people think like me being authentic is like an attractive quality because to be honest that I did not consider that I just that was just me being a goofball and so it's been it's been interesting for not just me but I think all my friends as well (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> that is interesting I'm sure yeah I'm sure your friends have a lot of good reactions it's a hard pill to swallow and yeah. like for me it's shocking I can't even imagine what they're going through <laughs> the, so yeah are they like wow I'm friends with a celebrity now or are they like wow Erica you've changed 
no they're like Erica what how did this happen (laughs) that's how it's like and I'm like I don't know like I don't know I don't know what I'm supposed to say but they're like how how like literally they just it, it doesn't make sense because it doesn't make sense to me either they're like how did this blow up into something bigger than your own you know what I mean because yeah. like I don't think I mean the only situation where I can think of a celebrity blowing up on social media is Sierra Schmidt dancing at trials but that was more so k-pop base and not quite like the whole universal being gay experience that it was like for me you know what i mean Mm -hmm. so like when i try to find people who have also been through it i kind of struggle and like you know what i mean of like how do you deal with said thirst trap (laughs) and when i figure it out i will let you know (laughs) well we'll we'll circle back to that one yeah ask me again in a few months yeah (laughs) another thing is like I mentioned my crush in an interview about how I had a crush on the same girl for three years that snowballed into something (laughs) I did a TikTok live and multiple people asked me if my crush was Katie Ledecky I said no no Katie's a great person but no definitely (laughs) not Katie you know what I mean yeah Like when people want to know who your crush is, it's very, it's an interesting road to try to navigate. That's for sure. It's been interesting. I bet. I can't. Yeah. I'm, I'm trying to put myself in in your shoes just for that one little situation. And I'm having a hard time because, because yeah, it's like, that's a, it's a really intimate piece of trivia about someone. And like, I tend to overshare. So I'm just, I have to like remind myself, like I can like egg it on and be like, yes, I do like my crush. Cause it's like, it's a, it's a gay troop to have a crush on the same girl for three years. That is like very cliche gay gay. And so I want it to be like, oh, I'm going through it too. Like I'm not that special, but also it's like, that is a, like, there are some parts of my life that I really like to hold close to myself and I will keep holding close to myself. Um, and like, I won't lie, like if people ask them if I'm in a relationship, I will be very straightforward. I'll be like, I'm, I'm not. But if I am, I don't know. I don't even know how I will navigate it, honestly. I think it's one of those things where I'm doing the same thing as Twitter. It's like, I guess we'll find out when it happens. You know? Yeah. But um, I'm excited to see what this evolves into, because one of the best things that has come from all that social media fame is that um very prominent people within the film industry have reached out to me so like amazon prime for the wilds the studio reached out to me to for because of the wild reason Mm -hmm. um one of the showrunners or programmers of sundance film festival reached out to me um i've had like directors reach out to me um yeah just a lot of voice actors just that kind of stuff and I mean, you to get your foot in the film industry, you got to have a few connections. Yeah. And the fact that I haven't even started film school yet, I start in the fall and I already have a few names under my belt. It's just like, it's a dream. I'm so lucky. I'm so grateful. I'm, you know what I mean? Like it's, it's, it's a crazy feeling. That I, hearing you list those, the, the names of the, you know, where these people are coming from, you know, be I've I've been loosely around film. I have friends in the film industry, and it's like that's a big deal. That's and it's extremely exciting. Like you said, to not have even really started that part of the journey yet, but to to have such a solid foundation already, it's like that's exciting. And I feel like that's something that happens to kids who already have their foot in the door through Hollywood, who have like parental connections, are the kind of situations where. They have, um, you know, uh, that, that foot in the door and those connections just right off the bat. It's very rare for someone like me who doesn't have any family within the film industry to have those ties off the bat. And I mean, I've made, a, I've made myself swear to anything that I will never, ever, ever take that for granted. And I'm going to use it to the best of my ability and hopefully be able to make Souls of Hopper like we talked about a year ago. Hopefully be able to make that baby and you know 
take as use my film career to boost or use my swim career to boost my film career and vice versa, use my film career to boost my swim career. And yeah, I'm excited to see what I could do with it. I'm honestly just amazed that you can balance, like that you can train for distance swimming and have the energy to do anything else. I think it's a coping mechanism. Like when I'm swimming, like you get, you know what I mean? Like with monotonous practices, you're just like, Ooh, idea, idea. Yeah. And so it just, it just comes that way. And, um, looking back, maybe that is why my movies tend to be about sad stuff because I'm in a lot of pain while I'm swimming. (laughs) Maybe, maybe that's what it is. Maybe I should talk to someone about that, (laughs) but, um, yeah, I think in those moments where you're in your own thoughts, that's when you create something really, really cool. I think, I think everyone has their place where they get really creative um, in terms of photography and film and reading and writing. But I think for me, I've learned to do it in the water and it's become very therapeutic for me. It makes total, I, I am right there with you. I, mm-hmm. I remember, I vividly remember going through long sets and being like, oh, wow, this would be a cool story idea. What if, yeah. what if this happened? What if that happened? And it's so cool because you could, you just have time to really like expand and think of scenarios and different situations. And, and if you stick to it long enough, you, you get a really good idea. I got, I did Souls of Hopper came to me when I was swimming in Lake Mead. Um, just, you know, doing those open water practices because all the pools are closed. Mm -hmm. and that's how souls came and it evolved into my my baby like that that project is my child and is my well-being and I will hold I will hold on to that thing for such a long time souls of hopper yes souls of hopper can you can you tell us a little bit about that where are you at with this project um film's pretty much done um in terms of script um it's gonna get adapted Um, film school I'm giving myself to give myself multiple revisions of it Mm -hmm. Um, I used a part of the script to submit to get into UT film school I used 500 words from the end of the movie and it was a really heavy scene Uh, not to glorify it all but dealing with the the negative effects of suicide and obviously there's negative effects because unfortunately one of the characters does end up passing away but you see it from a different point of view. You don't see it from the the victim's point of view, but you see it from her lover. And it's just this anger, um, guilt, embarrassment, just sadness, um, overwhelmed, like anxiety, just depression, like so many un, just understand, like misunderstood emotions at once. And Funny enough, I was so scared to submit it. Um, I was afraid it was a little too taboo and um, UT would not enjoy it. And I was really close to submitting their first kiss. I was like, it's more lighthearted. It's easier. But then I was just like, I want people to respect me in the industry right off the bat. And I don't want to be stereotyped as a romance writer which romance is very hard to write and it's very timing is very important, but I want to tell hard hitting stories. And I realized that if they don't like this really heavy scene, that's important to me, that does, they probably won't like the future stuff that I write within the film school. So I just kind of took a gamble and really submitted that heavy hitter and I'm I'm really glad they enjoyed it and they let me in the film school because they told me ahead of time that me getting in the film school was like my own merit and had nothing to do with swim. Yeah. I love the foresight that you put into that. <laughs> that, that that this this little this submission to get into the school will be what <laughs> how how they view me for my entire career. Yeah. I mean, like, I want to, you know what I mean? I want to set, I want to set the pace early. I want them to know like, yes, Erica Sullivan is a swimmer. Um, yes, she is like, gay and loves her gay movies, but I will not write the sappy romances. I want to do the hard hitting serious films that I feel like, I mean, it's getting better nowadays, but we still don't have enough of. Mm. And I want, I want to make my mark the same way I've done with Twitter for years. If they don't notice right away, they won't have to notice right away. 
But when my time comes and I do get recognized, I will always be there. And I have years of films and footage and scripts to look back on and they can be like, oh, she's always been like this. You know what I mean? (laughs) So, yeah, I mean, that's like my passion. That's one thing that's so important to me. And I I try to make it a pair and I try to prioritize it. Yeah, which I I think should be applauded. I think that's just a a really great way to approach that Mm -hmm. um, with anything. So let's talk about you going to school in the fall. You're finally starting college. Yes, I am. I am moving in seven days. Uh, that's, it, it sounds exciting. What, how are you feeling about that right now? Coming down to UT in Austin, uh, you know, going to film school, training with Carol and, and the women's team here. What are you thinking about all that right now? I'm ready. Um... I'm excited to see what Mitch and Carol can do with me coming off of this high um, in terms of just life and uh, emotion and swimming and all that and growth and all that stuff. And I'm excited to see what they turn it into, you know? Um, Yeah, it's, it'll be interesting and I'm, I'm ready to go. It's been time. I mean, with the seven years I've had, um, it's been a long time and especially the last one, which was unexpected. So I'm, I'm very happy with it. Yeah. That, that seems good. That seems like, (laughs) yeah, like you said, seven years, uh, is, is quite a while from the beginning of high school to starting your collegiate career for most and I'm gonna be honest here I think a lot of people didn't think I was gonna end up going to college I think people (laughs) realized I'd pushed it back for so long that I was never gonna go I was gonna go I just needed some time to do some stuff first like I promise which which makes total sense I think we've all seen that now and it, it obviously you know worked out fairly well in your favor <laughs> it worked out but I had years of so many family friends being like are you just still going to college <laughs> oh you're yeah. here you know like why why are you still at home I'm like mm, you see that doesn't make me feel too good <laughs> <laughs> I bet not uh but it, it's that's super exciting that you're going to be going there um Erica, I, I always appreciate you taking the time to sit down and chat. It's, it's mm-hmm. always just so great getting, getting to catch up with you. Um, any, any parting thoughts before we sign off today? Uh, let's do this anytime. I'm always down to talk about movie wrecks. Like we need to, we need to get a movie swim podcast going. We've got a group of uh, very prominent swimmers who are into movies and Maybe sit down, bring a few guests, bring you guys on our podcast and talk about movies and television and stuff like that. That'd be a dream. I feel like Cody was doing that for a little bit, uh, but I I agree that movie say, podcasts say, would be great. Let's go past the Star Wars and the Marvel films. I want to get into more like, let's go to Citizen K and Casablanca. You know what I mean? Uh, Bird, uh, no, 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 Moonlight. All right, let's do Moonlight. Let's, let's, yeah. let's get some good... <laughs> We don't need the action movies. Let's get the let's get the good emotional classics. You know. I'm down. I'm down. Let's good. let's do that. Uh, we'll <laughs> we'll get coffee in Austin and start our movie podcast. Done. That sounds great. Let's do that. That's a perfect place to do a, a movie podcast too. Austin, Texas. I think it's the place. Yeah. Right before South by Southwest. <laughs> we got it. We got it. You've been listening to the Swim Swam podcast. Stay tuned for new episodes every week. You can take Swim Swam podcast on the go by subscribing on your favorite podcast platform. Look for links in the description below and be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel for more videos as well.